how important our skeletal system is. And in fact, it's arguably one of the most critical systems in the human body. But no one really thinks about their bones. It's one of the most forgotten systems in the body as well. So until we break a bone or end up with a diagnosis like osteoporosis, nobody really considers their bone health. And that's exactly what we do at OsteoStrong all day, every day. So we are gonna take a little bit of a deep dive covering why bone health matters, why it should matter to you, the um, seven different functions of bone. It's so much more than just structure and support. We're gonna cover um, bone growth and remodeling, the uh, disease called osteoporosis, along with what it takes to um, slow down or maintain um, healthy bone density, and then what it takes to actually build it back. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. So why does our bone health matter so much? I talk about this a lot, but it's because it's so incredibly important. Um, our skeletal system is the most um, critical system in the human body. And as we're gonna learn over the next 45 minutes or so, our skeletal system is actually what allows us to stay active. And as long as we're active, we stay healthy and young. And there's four primary reasons why. One, our physical health, our ability to move and be active is actually the secret sauce to maintaining health and vitality in all of the other systems of the body. When we're able to move and enjoy life, our heart health, our digestion, our brain health, our kidneys, our liver, digestion, hormone balance, everything maintains health and improves. The opposite is true as well. When we start slowing down, everything else starts to slow down. But physical health actually starts with the foundation of the body, our skeletal system. Secondly, the strength of our bone tissue determines the strength of everything it attaches to it. The muscles, ligaments, tendons, joint structures, they're all dependent on the health and strength of our bones. In fact, our brain will never allow our muscles to become stronger than what our bones can handle. So as we age and naturally lose bone density, we have a harder time keeping our muscles and joints strong as well. So I just want you to consider this analogy. Imagine your house and imagine the foundation of your house. If you have a strong foundation, everything's great, right? But if your house has a weak foundation or um, starts to have issues with um, cracking or crumbling basement, everything that's built on top of that foundation is compromised. Our bodies are built the exact same way. As we age, we will all naturally lose bone density that will lead to a weakening foundation and you cannot build strong muscles, ligaments, tendons, and joint structures from a weak structure. So thirdly, bone diseases such as osteoporosis are increasing at alarming rates. One out of every two women and one out of every four men over the age of 50 are at risk for osteoporosis low bone density and will suffer a fracture. Those are huge numbers. And in fact, we are actually seeing bone density issues and increased fracture rates in our youth. Lots of lifestyle factors and dietary factors um, are playing into this, but it is, it is increasing um, at very rapid rates. And finally, in addition to all of that, our bone tissue actually serves many vital functions in the body. It's so much more than structure and support. So we're gonna briefly cover that. And there are seven primary functions of bone. So function number one, bones protect our internal organs. Bones provide frame and shape. Bones provide um, the ability for our body to move. Um, it's the attachment for all of our muscles and ligaments and tendons, our movers. Our bones actually act as a mineral reserve. They store calcium and phosphorus and other alkaline minerals critical to the functions of the body to maintain blood pH. Um, our bone tissue actually produces blood cells in our bone marrow, so red blood cells and white blood cells. Our bone tissue is, um, plays an integral role in hormone regulation, particularly um, metabolic hormone regulation um, through osteocalcin, which communicates directly with um, insulin for blood sugar management. And our bone tissue actually helps to detoxify the body as well. So our bones, while a lot of people don't consider um, bone tissue uh, as, a, as a kind of a system in the body, they're actually critical to normal functioning. So 
Moving on, we're gonna start talking about bone growth development and remodeling. We're gonna to touch briefly on this so you have a better understanding of bone health in general, because it's easy to think of bone as just hard and lifeless part of our body. But bone is actually living, growing tissue that's constantly being formed and broken down. Because of a process called remodeling where cells called osteoclasts, that's these guys right here, that's the jet camera guy, break down bone and uh, cells called osteoblasts, that's good, this guy here, he's our builder, build new bone. The bones that you have now are not the same bones that you're gonna have in seven to 10 years. And they're not the same bones you had seven to 10 years ago. And that's really cool because this gives you the possibility of improving your bone health with the right stimulus, regardless of your age. So in healthy bones, the osteoclast and the osteoblast activity is balanced. We have one builder for each guy that's um, kind of tearing things down and, and getting ready to replace with new. When this remodeling becomes unbalanced, in other words, when the breaking down starts to happen faster than the formation of new bone, or we have more guys, more workers um, tearing things down than we have builders building things back up, bone density um, becomes compromised and our bones can start to become thin and fragile. So let's talk about how bone changes throughout our lives. Throughout childhood, that's this over here, the osteoblasts or our bone forming cells are working harder than the osteoclasts or the cells that are breaking down bone. So we have lots of builders and not so many guys breaking things down. And there's a very steep acquisition of bone until we reach peak bone mass, which occurs at about the age of 30, or the ripe old age of 30. So the bone density you build as a child and throughout early adulthood is incredibly important. It kind of becomes your bone bank, if you will. Once you reach the age of 30 or peak bone mass, ideally the kind of bone remodeling process stays balanced. So that's where we have one guy building and one guy kind of breaking things down. The osteoblast and the osteoclast are working at the same pace and your bone mass pretty much stays stable. Until we hit um, menopause for women, which is typically about the age of 50, 55, and about the age of 70 for men. At menopause, because of the decrease in the hormone estrogen, the osteoblasts, our bone building cells, typically do not keep up with our osteoclasts. So we have more guys breaking bone down than we have builders building new bone. And there can be a rapid period of bone loss. During the five years around menopause, there are some women that can lose as much as 25 to 30% of their bone mass. Men continue to lose bone density at a steady but slower rate than women. At about the age of 70, however, the reduction in testosterone begins to cause more rapid bone loss for men as well. And this remodeling process is happening to all of us, it's happening to everyone. It's the natural aging process that occurs. So having an understanding of how bone develops helps us understand how we can prevent bone loss and ultimately osteoporosis. There are very important things we can do to support our bone health throughout our lives. Kids need to build as much bone as they possibly can in their teens and 20s, because during those years around puberty and into the early 20s, kids will build more bone than they will lose in their entire lifetime. That's part of the reason it's becoming an issue um, as our kids are leading more sedentary lives. They're less active. They're certainly much less weight bearing, um, high intensity activity. And um, there's some diet and lifestyle. There's very, very high stress, um, a lack of sleep, and then of course, um, pretty acidic diets as well. So nutrition, calcium, vitamin D, and physical activity are all important at every age. But as we get older, the key to keeping our bones strong is making sure our bone builders, our osteoblasts, are consistently triggered, are consistently showing up every day for work to stay active and keep up with our osteoclasts. So we're gonna move into um, some lifestyle factors that contribute to bone health, whether that is um, weakening bones or strong bones. Some of these lifestyle factors you can change and some you can't. Some are gonna be surprising. We hear a lot with our members that they're very surprised at just what can affect bone health. So let's talk about the things that you can't change. 
Um, first, 80% of people who have osteopenia or osteoporosis are women. Women have a higher risk of osteoporosis than men due to low estrogen levels as they age, which protect bones. Women also tend to be um, a little bit lighter and more fragile framed, so that can affect bone density as well. About 65% of your bone health can be attributed to heredity. So if your mother or father had osteoporosis, you're at a higher risk yourself. As we age, there's a certain amount of natural bone loss. So the older you are, the higher you are, the higher risk you are. And finally, there's a number of medical conditions and medications that can affect the bone. I'm gonna show you a list of the most common in a minute. And we can't do too much about these risk factors, but it is important that you're aware of them so that you can take extra steps to minimize their impact. So things you can change. There's a number of risk factors um, that you have control over. So getting enough calcium and vitamin D along with other nutrients, having a really good diet, supplementing when necessary, not smoking, limiting alcohol, increasing your physical activity, especially weight bearing activity and high impact exercise and remembering to improve your posture. And then before going on any medication, it's just really important that you talk with your doctor or pharmacist about any medications or medical conditions you might have that um, could be affecting your bone health just so that you are aware of that. So secondary osteoporosis um, is what we call bone, um, weakened bones caused by outside conditions, medical conditions or medications. I only show you this slide so you have an appreciation of the large number of conditions out there that can affect bone density. And a lot of people are surprised by some of the conditions on this list. So if you're diagnosed with a chronic illness, you should ask your doctor what other illnesses may be associated with it. If bone density is a concern because of your gender or heredity, or you've, you've had a bone density scan and you have osteopenia or osteoporosis, you need to increase your prevention strategies. And again, cancer and cancer treatments can cause bone loss as well. So just be aware of these guys and just be sure to talk with your doctor. If any of these, if you have any of these things on this list or anything else that you might be concerned about that could be affecting your bone health. And again, secondary osteoporosis, these are medications that can also have a direct impact on your bone health. And again, I show you this slide just so you have an appreciation um, of some of the different medications because a lot of the medications that are on this list are very common for people to be taking and very common for people to be taking for many, many, many years. Having no idea that it could you know, ultimately be affecting um, bone health or um, lead to a diagnosis like osteoporosis. For instance, um, the PPIs, proton pump inhibitors, those are the medications for GERD, like Nexium or Prilosec, um, and then steroids are probably the two biggest culprits of secondary osteoporosis. And most people who are taking those medications have no idea until they're, they're ultimately diagnosed with osteoporosis. So just be aware of any potential medications and visit with your medical doctor about any options if you're taking some and you're concerned. So bone loss has always kind of been considered silent and most of the time we're not diagnosed until we either suffer um, an unexplained fracture or we end up with a DEXA scan um, at the age of 65 or it's just ordered by our medical doctor and it's ultimately you know, diagnosed. However, because your brain will never allow your muscles to become stronger than your bones, the muscles naturally become weaker as we age and harder and harder to maintain that strength. So if you look here, this is a picture of the inside of a 30 year old bone, this picture here on the left. And here's the same bone at the age of 50. You can tell the difference. The one at the age of 50 is quite a bit thinner. So it's, it becomes weaker because it's thinner on the inside. And when the bones get weak, your muscles get weak as well. So as you start to become weaker um, in your muscular and uh, ligaments and tendons in your joint structures, there are a whole host of symptoms um, that can be attributed to weakening bone density. So here's a list, back pain and joint pain, loss of flexibility and joint motion, um, nerve damage simply because there's a lot more um, strain, loss of reaction time, change in posture, decreased balance and loss of strength. And ultimately a person can end up with a diagnosis of osteopenia or osteoporosis if too much bone density is lost. So what is osteoporosis exactly? Well, osteoporosis is a disease um, that's diagnosed and characterized by loss of bone mass leading to fragile bones that break easily. 
Now, as we already discussed, bone is living tissue. It goes through a continual process of remodeling where old bone is removed and replaced by new bone. Healthy bone on the left here again is nice and strong. It holds us up, it protects our internal organs, supports our biological processes. And when muscles contract and relax, bones help us move around. And we just covered a lot of things that can affect bone tissue, causing it to lose density and possibly become osteoporotic, which is what this picture on the right is. You can see that the bone on the right is thinner and you can just imagine that it won't hold up to all that we might expect it to do. We frequently hear about people sneezing and ending up with a, with, a, with a broken bone or walking and a hip kind of gives out. So if you compare the two pictures, you can absolutely see why that might happen. So is osteoporosis a problem? It is actually an epidemic in this country. 70% of people with osteoporosis have not been screened, so they're not even aware they have the disease. In fact, many people are ultimately diagnosed with osteoporosis after they suffer from a fracture. One out of every two women and one out of every four men over the age of 50 are at risk for osteoporosis, low bone density, and will suffer a fracture. Osteoporosis, it's, an, it's a life altering disease and it is a major public health problem in this country. As to most recent estimates, um, the, the cost of treatment for osteoporosis and osteoporotic fractures is billions of dollars. Um, that doesn't take into account the loss um, of quality of life, which in my mind is the most expensive part. Every 20 seconds, somebody in this country has a preventable fracture due to bone mass. So during our time together today, approximately an hour, 180 Americans will have a preventable fracture. It is an epidemic. Osteoporosis and fracture um, are a major public health concern in this country and many initiatives, including Osteoporosis Awareness Month every May um, are taking place to help bring awareness of this condition. It affects more women than breast cancer, stroke and heart attack combined. We must all make bone health and osteoporosis process prevention a priority. It affects men and women from all racial groups and absolutely robs people of their independence and quality of life. But the good news is that osteoporosis is very preventable once you know what to do and now treatable. Today is a great day to start taking action that will improve your bone health for a lifetime. Um, healthy bone tissue equals healthy and strong life. So let's talk about how to assess your risk. How do you know? Where, what do you do? How do you get diagnosed? How do you even know where to begin? There are two approaches. There are screening tools and then there are diagnostic tools. They're very different. Um, the, the screening tools may lead to an ultimate diagnosis, but the gold standard for true diagnosis is a DEXA scan right now, which is x-ray technology. So some screening tools, a recent risk fracture may seem insignificant, but can be an important signal that your bones may not be as strong as they could be. Height loss can be another sign um, of low bone density. More than an inch of height loss can signal micro fractures in your spine, which are often not painful and pretty easy to ignore. So make sure that you get your height measured regularly and certainly at every doctor's visit. There are opportunities also to get wrist and heel screens. Um, these kind of occur commonly at health fairs. And we also have um, wrist or heel uh, wrist screening done at OsteoStrong for our members who have not had a recent DEXA scan. American Bone Health also has a tool online called the Fracture Risk Calculator. It goes over some different lifestyle questions um, along with health, health history and gives you um, low, moderate, or high risk of having a fracture. That's another screening tool. But if any of these screening tools show that you're at risk, you need to get diagnosed. And again, the only way to get a, a true diagnosis is through a DEXA, a DEXA scan is what it's called. And it's x-ray technology that um, your medical doctor actually orders and has done. And you get um, measures the amount of bone density in your spine and in your hips, the two um, weight bearing areas of the body. All women over the age of 65 and all men over the age of 70 need to have a DEXA scan if for no other reason than just a baseline measurement. At the age of 65, Medicare fully covers um, a DEXA scan every 24 months. And if you're younger and you have any one risk factor, whether it's risk factors we already covered earlier, or um, one of these screening uh, tools indicates uh, potential, you need to talk with your doctor about getting this test ordered. 
And so what, is it, what does a DEXA scan give us? Well, a DEXA scan actually gives us what's called a T-score. So if you've had a DEXA scan, you're probably familiar with this score that we call a T-score. But when you get a bone density test, the results are reported um, as a T-score, which indicates how far away your bone density is from the normal. And the normal is based on the bone density expected for an average healthy person at the age of 30. Because again, um, peak bone mass typically is reached by the age of 30. So your T-score is gonna be given to you in a, a number basically on a, scale, on a scale from four positive um, through four negative. So if you end up with um, a T-score say in the spine of a positive 1.0, that's normal. Anything that is above a negative one T-score all the way up is considered normal. So you're in the green. Low bone density is from negative one to negative 2.5. That's the kind of yellow light. That's your warning sign that we're having some bone loss. And if we don't stop, it's probably going to move into the red area, which is negative 2.5 or below, which is, a, which is ultimately a diagnosis of osteoporosis. And the way I kind of like to explain T-scores, because they really don't mean anything to anybody. I mean, a T-score of negative one doesn't really tell you a whole lot, but it can be very roughly correlated to percent bone density. So what I mean by that is if you have a negative one T-score, you essentially have like a 10% loss of normal bone density. If you have a positive one, you have essentially 10% more than normal bone density or negative 2.5, which is where we, the cutoff for osteoporosis basically equates to about a 25% bone loss. So it's a very rough guesstimate, but it mean, it, it, thinking of it that way means a whole lot more than just a, a random number. So that is how we interpret T-scores. And those T-scores come um, from a DEXA scan. So we're gonna move on. Now that you understand the importance of bone health, how bones develop and remodel over our lifetime, risk factors that can affect your bone health, osteoporosis and how we diagnose it and looking at T-scores and DEXA scans, let's turn our attention to what we can do about it and then we're gonna talk about prevention as well. So calcium and vitamin D is what I call the dynamic duo. And I think it's what everybody equates to strong bones, right? We just break our milk and we're good to go. Calcium is the mineral that makes your bones strong and calcium needs vitamin D to absorb it into the body. So vitamin, excuse me, vitamin D is kind of like the railroad uh, cart that transports calcium out of the gut. Once it's broken down, gets it into the bloodstream so that it can be delivered throughout the rest of the body. So the two go hand in hand. The amounts that you need um, of each do vary with age. Generally, you wanna get between 1,000 and 1,200 milligrams of calcium every single day. And this is um, through your, both your diet and supplements. And it would be great if we can get it through your diet um, alone through the food that you eat. And it's pretty easy if you eat a lot of dairy um, and a lot of green leafy veggies. But if you don't eat a lot of dairy um, or greens, you may need a calcium supplement. There's a caveat to this. Your body can actually only absorb about 500 milligrams at a time, whether that's in a meal or in a supplement or a meal supplement combined. The reason I bring that up is because we talk with members a lot about calcium in here. And a lot of our members will take their calcium supplement in the morning with their breakfast. But their breakfast is a high calcium breakfast. It's a bowl of yogurt or a bowl of cereal with milk. And then they're taking their calcium supplement with that as well. And out of the two of those, you're only going to absorb about 500, maybe 600 milligrams of calcium. And that's not enough. And if that's your high calcium intake for the day, you're not going to be getting enough to maintain optimal bone health. So we know that vitamin D is also called the sunshine vitamin, but concerns about skin cancer and the latitude of the sun make it um, a very difficult for us to kind of naturally get enough vitamin D. Vitamin D supplements are inexpensive and every with, any, anyone with concerns about bone health needs to be taking vitamin D. However, the amount varies by person. The most recent recommendation from the Institutes of Medicine for vitamin D is about 2000 IUs per day because we live in the Northern hemisphere. Check with your doctor, however, about having your vitamin D levels checked for proper dosage. Um, your vitamin D levels are normal, 2000 IUs a day would be perfect. If they're slightly below, below normal, we might need to bump that up. But if they're um, significantly below normal, we may need a prescription dose to actually bring those vitamin D levels up to where they need to be. 
Um, but research is actually showing that vitamin D um, just plays a role in virtually every system of the body. Vitamin D is essential for immune health, digestion, brain health, um, even mental health with depression and anxiety. And research is actually showing that vitamin D plays an integral role in our nervous system and balance and can reduce falls by up to 20%. So stay tuned as we hear more about this um, and about the benefits of vitamin D. So protein and omega-3 fatty acids are also very, very, very important for bone health as well. Those you need to be getting through your diet. Um, if you're not a big protein eater or you're not a big um, fish and flaxseed and um, avocado eater, then you may need to um, look and um, into some supplementation for protein and omega-3 fatty acids as well. So exercise for bone health. Um, exercise and the right type of exercise matters. And it matters a lot. So weight-bearing exercises will help slow bone loss. They help stimulate our bone building cells. Those osteoblasts are worker guys that are laying down the new concrete, the new bone cells, um, through the impact of weight bearing transmitted through the bone. Walking, weightlifting, jump rope, dancing, tennis, you know, jogging, Pilates, yoga, it's all great. It have many, many, many health benefits and, and will also help with balance and um, fracture prevention. But be aware that these activities will not build bone density. They will help slow bone loss, but there is just simply not enough stimulus, which we're gonna talk about here in a minute, um, to actually build back bone density that's been lost. So exercise to prevent falls and fractures, because that's the big deal with, with uh, bone density, and especially if we've been diagnosed with osteoporosis. We don't wanna fall, and we certainly do not wanna have a fracture. So preventing falls and fractures is so important, and I'm gonna make sure that you get up with me we're gonna have enough sitting. Um, we're gonna get up, we're gonna move our body. Oh, go ahead and stand up with me. And now that we're standing, I'm gonna have you just um, take kind of an assessment. Were you able to get up out of your chair without using your arms? This is a great indicator of your leg strength. Strong legs help prevent falls and fractures. So if you couldn't get out of your chair without using your arms, it's something that would be great to start practicing. One thing you can work on during your day is doing a modified squat over your chair. So try to get up out of that chair without using your arms. Make sure that chair is behind you and do kind of a modified squat. Getting up, you need to use your, your arms to do that. Awesome, just slowly work into being less and less dependent on, those, um, on your arms. Do a couple of these whenever you can and see how quickly your thigh muscles start to respond and how quickly you start to get stronger. And now that you're standing, let's talk about posture. We learned about the importance of posture as kids. I think we probably all grew up with a mom that you know poked us in the middle of the back, stand up straight, right? We need to be reminded of it as we get older. Thinning the muscles between your shoulders can help protect your spine and improve your balance as well. Let's stand up straight as we can. We're gonna do an exercise that works, uh, feels great and works awesome for posture. So we're gonna put our arms out into a big Y. We're gonna bring down into a W and out into a T. So Y, W, T feels great. We get a nice good stretch on the front of the chest and we get some muscle contraction between the shoulder blades and in that lower neck. It feels great and it really opens up the body and encourages that normal posture. Single leg balancing is also really important. So if you're standing and you have a chair, um, Try holding onto the back of the chair on the, or the counter that you're standing in front of. Stand on one leg. And if you work on this throughout the day, you're going to notice a significant difference in a very short amount of time and be able to balance without holding on. So felt good to kind of get up and move for a little bit. I've been talking for a while. So hopefully you guys got a little energy refresher, a little more oxygen into, into the brain. And you're still with me here. So we are now going to talk about what it actually takes to build bone density. So what are our choices if we want to actually build it, not just slow it down? If you're diagnosed with osteoporosis or you have a fracture, there are medication options. And what we just talked about, you know, about walking, yoga, Pilates, and balance exercises are great forms of exercise and they're wonderful for heart health and mental health and digestion and joint flexibility and all kinds of good stuff. They simply do not provide enough stimulus to bone tissue to actually increase bone density. And the same is with proper nutrition. Well, calcium and vitamin D and an awesome diet and anti-inflammatory fish oils and protein 
um, along with a really healthy lifestyle and getting enough sleep are essential for health in general and essential for bone health as well. Without the proper stimulus, the body cannot build from raw materials alone. So what does it take? There are medication options, like I mentioned, from pills to injections. However, I will, one caveat, we are not physicians here and therefore you know, we don't give out medical advice nor do we do visit with people about medications that they um, may or may not be considering taking. So talk to your doctor and be informed on how these medications work. Many of them are what we call self-limiting, meaning they could, you can only be on them for a certain period of time because they will start to create more brittleness and increase your fracture risk after a number of years. So visit with your doctor about how they work and just be informed. Um, we have several members here that take medication along with Osteo, um, Osteo Strong program here, take medication and do um, other forms of bone building exercises through other programs out there. We have some members who were on the medication, got out of the osteoporosis diagnosis and have to be on their drug holiday. So now they're doing um, this to help prevent um, significant bone loss. So just be advised, just know and be your own advocate on how these medications work and um, if they're appropriate for, for you and your um, health history. There's a lot of debate right now in the bone health world um, between bone density and bone quality when it comes to fracture prevention. So we're gonna talk about um, the importance of bone density and building bone through natural processes and building that healthy new bone tissue, which um, leads to nice, pliable, flexible, and elastic bone tissue. So lifestyle and nutrition for bone health. Left column is all everything that you need to say yes to everything you need to say no to um, because it affects bone health in a, in a dramatically negative way. So yes, sleep. You need to be getting more than six hours of sleep per day, preferably all at the same time. So during the night, but a lot of people are sleep challenged and so naps are good too. Um, six hours is an absolute minimum. Um, anywhere from seven to nine is actually ideal. Reduce your stress, laugh, practice gratitude. Um, take a look at your calcium and vitamin D3 intake through your diet and or supplementation. Make sure that you're spreading those out throughout the day so the body can actually absorb what you are taking in. Um, protein and omega-3 fatty acids as well. Say no, limit alcohol. And this is especially important for women. Um, alcohol has a direct impact on estrogen levels. So post-menopause, we need all the estrogen that we can, um, that we can get. No smoking. No soda and limit your coffee intake. Both of them are stimulants and they do decrease um, circulation and the body's ability to circulate um, nutrients, including calcium and vitamin D and other minerals. Water, water, water. If you're an OsteoStrong member, you know how important water is to us um, here at the center. Reduce your sugar intake and then watch your sodium. Um, sodium is highly acidic to the body. The body will use calcium to buffer that sodium. It's um, hard on your kidneys as well. So just watch that sodium intake. So now let's talk about physical stimulus, physical activity. What actually increases bone density um, versus just slowing, uh, slowing bone loss? So we know that weight bearing and high impact exercises are best when it comes to bone health, but what does it actually take? You know, why is running and jump rope and that kind of thing just simply not enough? We're gonna get into a little bit of science here, so bear with me. But we've known since the 19th century, based on Wolf's Law, that our bones adapt to the stressors or demands placed on them. Um, similar to muscle tissue, similar to lifting weights. When you put pressure or a compressive force, like this uh, little video here is showing, on your bone tissue, your bone tissue responds by remodeling and becoming stronger. So that kind of compressive tissue, that stimulus, that load, actually stimulates your osteoblasts, your worker guys, to get to work. We need to lay down new bone tissue. This is a process called osteogenesis, or new bone growth. Um, that compressive force, that load, stimulates our worker guys, and they're triggered to get to work. They lay down new bone tissue as a protective measure. Just like many processes in the body, our bone responds to the environment in which it's placed. So other examples of this would be when your pupils dilate and constrict um, with sunlight or when you shiver or uh, sweat um, based on temperature. But even though we've known about Wolf's Law for over a century, it actually wasn't until 2012 that a group of researchers discovered just how much force it takes to stimulate osteogenesis or that new bone growth. 
And what they discovered was actually really surprising. They found that it takes 4.2 multiples of body weight, of force or compressive load to stimulate osteogenesis in the hip joint. So that's a significant amount of load. That's a lot of weight. If you weigh 150 pounds, that's a minimum of 630 pounds of pressure of consistent stimulus to generate that new bone growth to outpace our natural bone loss. So how in the world do we do this? Because we know that walking, yoga, Pilates, and balance exercises are all great and they're all weight-bearing activities, but they simply do not provide that level of stimulus to bone tissue to increase bone density. So if we look here on this um, chart, swimming and cycling, bicycling are actually unloaded exercises. They're great for other health um, benefits, but they have zero load on the musculoskeletal system. Briskly walking is about one to two multiples of body weight. Running and jogging, we can get kind of upwards of three. And then jumping and strength training, um, things like gymnastics is where we get into that um, four plus multiples of body weight. Um, gymnastics and power lifting will do it. In fact, gymnasts have some of the most dense bone tissue um, and some of the strongest muscles and joint structures of any human being on the earth. However, as we get older, um, of course, gymnastics and powerlifting carry a pretty high risk of injury. And a lot of us you know, aren't gonna be able to stick that four foot landing without injuring ourselves. And that's actually where this kind of newer concept called osteogenic loading comes in. It's the technology that we use at Osteostrong here in Sioux Falls, and it allows us to safely reach the types of forces, often upwards of five to eight multiples of body weight, to stimulate osteogenesis naturally, to trigger those bone building cells, um, those worker guys to get to work while minimizing the risk of in injury. And when you focus on strengthening the foundation of the body and really focus on building bone um, density and, and new bone growth, everything strengthens that attaches to those bones as well. So all the muscles, all the ligaments, all the tendons in your joint structure strengthen as well. So posture and balance improves, you become more flexible and agile, we reduce back and joint pain, you become less prone to injury, you have more energy, you're just overall physically stronger and healthier. And we've even had some people who start to gain their height back, which is pretty cool. Um, and then if you have type 2 diabetes, your A1C can improve as well. Um, for other reasons, bone tissue plays a little bit of a role in sugar metabolism. Um, but when you strengthen the muscles and ligaments and tendons and create um, more dense tissue, the body just more efficiently utilizes glucose and becomes more responsive to insulin. So that's actually what we do at OsteoStrong. We utilize osteogenic loading technology um, to kind of emulate or stimulate um, that load on the skeletal system and start to build um, healthier, more dense bone tissue. <coughs> Excuse me. When you combine those high impact forces, or osteogenic loading with proper nutrients and positive lifestyle changes, amazing things start to happen um, to your overall health and wellness. So as we come to the end here, some important things to remember because we covered a lot. Um, peak bone mass is at about 30 years old. So building that bone bank early in life is so important. So encourage your kids, encourage your grandkids. They need to be active. They need to be taking care of themselves. Um, get them out, jump in the hay bales. If you have, you know, a farm available, they need to be carrying those five gallon buckets, get them involved in high impact sports and things of that nature. Um, remember the seven key functions of bone. Bone tissue is absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm a, I'm a musculoskeletal health geek. So I realize I have a little bit different take on a um, little different obsession than the average person. Um, but our bone tissue is beyond fascinating. It's so much more than just structure and support and movement. Know the difference between slowing bone loss and what it takes to actually build bone density. We need the building blocks, which is proper nutrition, calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, um, omega-3 fatty acids, protein, vitamin D3, plus the proper stimulus, the proper work, the proper trigger to actually build that bone density back. In the um, kind of analogy of the house um, or a construction project, we need both the materials and the landscapers, the workers to show up. We can't build if we don't have both. It's important to know your risk factors so you know what you can control and what you can't. 
And I always like to make sure that people have some action steps. What's next? Um, information is great, but action is where um, real change takes place. So each of you probably noticed something different or something that caught your attention throughout this presentation. So I'd like to leave you today with at least one thing that you're gonna do as a result of this talk. It could be to get an assessment of your bone health and risk of fracture. This is a great place to start. Just look through those um, kind of screening tools. Um, go online, take the American Bone Health Fracture Risk Assessment. Um, you could start slowing bone loss by making sure you're getting enough calcium and vitamin D. And just take a look at what your kind of daily average diet is. If you need to be splitting out that calcium supplementation throughout the day, making sure you're taking it away from calcium loaded um, meal, do that. Um, what about incorporating some weight bearing exercises? Remember, we talked about balance and posture. This can help prevent falls and fractures. So do the YWT exercise, stand on one foot, try to get out of a chair without using your arms. And finally, if you know you have low bone density or osteoporosis, learn what you need to know about the options that are available to you to treat that. But most importantly, I hope you now understand the consequences of not taking any action. Um, please don't be a victim of osteoporosis. Don't um, sit on the sidelines and let life pass you by. Support your bones for a lifetime of health. We've covered a lot of material. So if you don't remember it all, the recording along with a copy of the slide deck are on their way. It'll probably be a day or two. It just takes quite a while to download um, videos of this length. Um, if you're an OsteoStrong member, talk to your coach at your next session. Give us a call or shoot us a text um, if you have questions that don't get covered at the end of the talk here coming up. Check out the website, um, www.osteostrong.me. American Bone House website is also a great um, resource for information. You can also shoot us an email. And if you're not an OsteoStrong member and you're wondering if what we do here and if OsteoStrong could be right for you, talk to us about your health goals. Um, schedule a free in-center session, experience the osteogenic loading program that we have here. We also go over um, an individualized wellness assessment and get to know you and your specific health goals. So give us a call or shoot us a text or an email if you're interested in learning more. So that's all I have for you today. And I do have time for a few questions. So Sarah, if there's some questions in the chat, that would be great. Hello, all right, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Um, the question we have is, um, can you touch base again on how balance and losing strength is related to bone health. Oh, sure, absolutely. So that's actually something, um, a lot of people just don't equate balance or losing strength or just kind of, I think what everybody considers the natural aging process. Most people have, they, they never correlate that to the, the strength of their bone tissue or their bone health. But that's again, one of those, you're only as strong as your foundation, just like you know your house or that analogy of you know a building or a structure. So as you start to lose your balance or start to lose strength, or even become more injury prone or have you know kind of chronic back and joint pain, remember your muscles and ligaments and tendons can only become as strong as your bone tissue. Meaning we can never like lift enough weights or do enough exercise to become stronger than what our bones can handle. We, we can't ever become strong enough to break our own bones, if you will. So if we know past the age of 30 that everybody's skeletal system starts to weaken, it's just the kind of the natural aging process, unless you're doing something to slow that down or to stop it. And so you're naturally gonna lose muscular strength and then structural support through your ligaments and tendons as your bone tissue starts to weaken as well. And this is regardless of whether you're ever diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis, those diagnoses are just a much bigger deal, but you can build your balance back, get stronger and you know, reverse back and joint pain and um, kind of stop those recurring injuries and all kinds of this awesome stuff just by focusing on strengthening your bone tissue. So pretty cool. So I hope that kind of cleared that up. Awesome, thank you so much. And then can you just touch base again on how do we get a DEXA scan if their medical doctors never talk to them? Oh, sure, yes. Okay, so we hear that a lot actually um, with people who come in, especially for the first time, if, especially if they've not been diagnosed with osteoporosis or osteopenia. A DEXA scan is, um, it's basically just a full body kind of x-ray. Very, very, very simple, but Everybody that goes on Medicare at the age of 65 
is eligible and should have that first initial DEXA scan done. Um, it is probably one of the most forgotten screening tools at that transition with Medicare is that we're also doing the heart screening and the stress tests and the colonoscopies and the mammograms and all of that stuff. We're assessing the health of um, kind of that baseline health of every system in the body, but a DEXA scan is the same. So if your medical doctor doesn't bring it up to you, just simply ask. You can even just call in and visit with the front desk or the nurse because most, most of your medical doctors will just call it in and order it. Um, it takes about 10 or 15 minutes and then you get your report, which will give you um, what your T-score is for your baseline. If you're prior to the age of 65 and you have any of the risk factors at all, just give your medical doctor a call. If you have your annual physical coming up, bring it up to them um, and explain why, just have that conversation. And um, most likely your medical doctor will order it for you. If you don't have health insurance or your medical doctor won't, or you just don't have a medical doctor, you can actually um, schedule your own DEXA scan and pay for it out of pocket. They typically run about 150 to $200. So they're not, um, they're not a, a massively expensive um, exam to have done if you have to pay for it out of pocket. It's not like an MRI or other imaging that's you know, you know, $1,500 or $2,000 out of pocket. So talk with your medical doctor or just call um, one of the imaging centers, just Google it. Um, and DEXA scans around Sioux Falls and, and um, you can order one yourself as well. Awesome. And on that, um, what is the importance of having them done at the same facility, those DEXA scans? So that actually is one of the biggest challenges with um, DEXA scanning. There's, um, in order to have those DEXA scans done, where we can compare if you're actually losing bones, so we do them about every two years. But in order to actually compare those scans, they have to be done at the same facility, on the same piece of equipment, um, or at the very least, the same technology is used. And ideally with the exact same technician, there's some issues with positioning and body positioning and all of that kind of stuff. So they need to be at the same facility. They need to be utilizing the same equipment and ideally more often than not realistic, but the same technician as well. Great, thank you so much for that clarification. And then we yeah. just had one last question and that is, you know, for people who have always taken their calcium, their vitamin D, ate a big, you know, lots drink their milk, like we were told as kids, why again do they still end up with osteoporosis even though they're doing all the right things? Yeah, so that's another, um, I think probably huge misconception with bone health specifically. Um, the nutrients, while they're absolutely vitally important, your bone tissue will not absorb those nutrients out of the bloodstream unless there is new bone growth happening. So it's the new healthy bone tissue that's actually absorbing those nutrients to build the structure. And we now know, because we understand bone growth and remodeling, that the only way to get those, the, those new healthy bone cells is we have to trigger them to become active. They respond to the environment in which they're placed, the bone tissue does. So if you're not doing anything to trigger new bone growth or trigger osteoblastic activity, there simply isn't going to be enough activity or enough new cells to take those nutrients in. So you have to do the work along with have the nutrients or have the materials in order for the structure to be built. I think it's easiest when we're talking about the human body, I think it's easiest to compare that to muscles. I think everybody knows that you can't just eat a steak every day and you're gonna have Arnold Schwarzenegger muscles, right? You still have to do the work, you still have to lift the weights. And likewise, you can lift all the weights in the world, but if you're not taking in protein, you're never gonna build muscle tissue. So bone, bone tissue is the exact same, we just don't think about it. So you have to have the building blocks and you have to do the work to build the structure. So calcium and all of those bone building nutrients are absolutely vital. That's the reason you can be doing all of that right and still end up with osteopenia or osteoporosis if you don't have the proper stimulus. So I hope that kind of clears that up. All right, I believe those are all of our questions. All right. Well, if anybody um, you know, is listening to this later or you end up with any questions, don't hesitate to ask at your um, next session if you're a member, or like I said, give us a call or, um, you know, send us a text message with any any questions or information or if you want to know more.